Welcome to another episode of Art Heals All Wounds. I'm your host, Pam Uzel. On this show, we meet artists transforming lives with their work. Let me ask you a question. Do you think time travel is possible? There are so many books and movies about time travel, and usually there's some kind of really complex machine with advanced physics that make it possible for someone to travel through time. What I think is that you've probably traveled in time many times with something that isn't a machine at all. Think about this. Have you ever been driving and listening to the radio and suddenly a song comes on that was something you listened to all the time when you were younger? What happens to you then? Do your thoughts and emotions immediately return to that earlier time? And do memories from that time come flooding back to you from the very first opening notes of that favorite song? My guest on this episode of Art Heals All Wounds understands very well this magical power of music. His name is Orlando Williams, and he's been a DJ since the early 80s. He's always had a special connection with music, and from a young age was fascinated by the way it could shape emotions in the listener. He shares with us how, for him, music has been a key to building community through the emotional experiences he creates with music. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. You can get more information about this podcast and get in touch with me on the Facebook page, Art Heals All Wounds, and on Twitter and Instagram at Art Heals Podcast. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Listen and let us inspire you. Who listening has seen the television show Soul Train? Remember how all of the dancers would dance two by two through the lines of other dancers? Did anyone besides me used to practice the dance moves they would do if they ever got a chance to dance down the Soul Train? I feel sure that I am not the only one. Well, here's something interesting. There's a world record of the largest soul train in the Guinness Book of World Records. In 2011, Berkeley High, the high school in Berkeley, California, set the record with 211 students dancing down the soul train. I think the current record of the longest soul train is now up to 426 dancers, set in Goodyear, Arizona in 2014. At least that's what it said when I looked it up in the Guinness Book of World Records. My next guest, Orlando Williams, was one of the people behind the record-breaking Soul Train at Berkeley High in 2011. He's been DJing since the mid-80s and has been involved in numerous music events that happen in Berkeley. I first met him DJing at a fundraiser for my child's elementary school. Listening to him was like a total disconnect. On the one hand, you had parents trying to figure out the cotton candy machine, and on the other, you had one of the best DJs I've ever heard providing the music. I soon found out that Orlando was involved in lots of events in Berkeley. In fact, anytime I went to a street fair or festival and saw Orlando setting up, I would go, phew, this is going to be fun. He's been on my mind during the pandemic with everything being shut down. I'm really happy to have a chance to catch up with him to find out what's coming up next for him and to ask him some questions that I've never had a chance to ask him before. Hi, Orlando. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, my pleasure. Good to see you. (laughs) Nice to see you too. Yes, it really is. How did you get started DJing? Oh, wow. Um, That had to be about... 1982. Wow. Yeah, about 1982, 80, yeah, 81, 82, let's call it. I was introduced to it by my older brothers. And that was a club in Emeryville called Silks. 
And Silks was at that time in its heyday, like the number one club in the East Bay to go to. And it was a warehouse scenario where you had oh, DJs playing until four in the morning. Now I was underage, I could never get in. So I would hang outside and just kind of watch the people go in and out and listen to the music. And, you know, it was just really something to see how music would move people. I mean, I was always intrigued by music and its ability to trigger emotions. And that was at an early age from just going to the movies and it just seemed, you know, how the certain scenes would come on and the music would start and everybody would start crying. It's just like, oh, or cheering and the music would just change. And so I was always kind of really, how would I want to say, um, deep into listening into music. You know, I have a, a, a very talented musical family member. Miles Davis is my great uncle, by the way. I yeah. never knew yeah. that. Yeah. And my grandmother's brother. Yeah. yeah. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I've always listened to my mom's music and just kind of being around it. And so I would tag around with my brothers and they would always come out, you know, walking back home from there and just talk about all the fun they had. And so I, I was eager to go. Fast forward about a year or so later, I had a friend who... I admit he just moved up from LA and he was a DJ. And then I realized I had another friend that was a DJ. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm getting a little bit closer. And so I hung out with them. I picked up some skill sets. One of my friends, uh, James Adamos, he had an older brother, Joel, and he was the DJ at the time, you know? And we picked up um, some skill sets from him and his friend who was from New York. So we were getting a little bit of, you know, I guess I was blessed enough to get a little bit of L.A. style, a little bit of New York style. Um, soon after, got my own equipment and then just put in the work, you know, and it was all about running up to Telegraph every Saturday, Sunday morning. Leopold's Tower Records, you know, spending a whole day up there just digging through crates. Right. Finding all, I mean, like all the good stuff because uh, Berkeley was pretty special back then because you had like four record stores within three blocks. So people came, you know, all around from Sacramento to San Jose to shop for vinyl. Um, then we'd run home and, and put it on and, and get to work. Yes. And for anybody who's listening outside of the Bay Area, if you haven't heard of Telegraph Avenue, it is probably the most well-known street in Berkeley. Would you agree with that, Orlando? Most definitely. Most definitely. Especially during that time, because, you know, it was, I would say it was, I don't want to say the better part of Berkeley, because, you know, my, my time span um, will only cover so much at that age. But um, just growing up there, you know, you run up there to play pinball, grab some pizza, just hang out on the ad, as they used to say, right. you know, it was somewhat of a, I won't say a drag ship, but people would drive their nice cars by slowly on Sunday. So right. it was a place to be on the weekend. Right. Sure. And it's where a lot of very famous protests and things happened before, uh, you know, a decade or two before that. Oh, yeah. What kind of music were you looking for? I'm, I'm glad you asked that because, you know, as we come to find out later, we were really, um, how can I say? Uh, thankful, I can say thankful and lucky, blessed and all that to be in Berkeley at that time, because there was a good balance of everything in music. You know, Oakland was thriving in funk. Berkeley had this pop hippie appeal to it. You know, hip hop was being pushed in from New York. Um, House was arriving from Chicago. And so Berkeley being the melting pot that it was then, you wanted to play a little bit of everything. So we were playing Devo and Kraftwerk with Pat Benatar and Madonna. And I mean, we played it all, which made the event or parties that we were doing just the best I felt, you know what I mean? Cause everybody had a good time. You know, we, we just tried to serve everybody that we seen in a crowd, you know, growing up in Berkeley, it was a melting pot then. So, you know, we just picked up a little bit from everybody and made sure that, you know, when we had our parties, cause we gave, we definitely gave our share in high school. Actually, those house parties started at my mom's house. She let me have two. Oh. By the second one, they got <laughs> they, they, they got pretty no big more. fast. You're a Berkeley native. Yeah, born and raised. In um, high school, we started a, um, a DJ group, the Mixologist DJs. 
And that ran probably from 1983 until about 86. I graduated in 85, so it, it carried on a couple of years after me. In our earlier days, we, um, over um, our mentor's house, we would be upstairs. We had a two-story house. We'd be upstairs with the window open, speakers pointed outside, and his little brother and his breakdance crew would be out on linoleum. And at that time, a young fella, <laughs> same age as me, though, actually, uh, graduated the same year, uh, DJ Fuse, Digital Underground. Wow. Um, he was one of the individuals down there. And one day came up, um, wanted to see what was going on in that room. Um, he took one look and wanted to do his thing, and he got his turntables. We went over there and helped him balance his needles and the rest was history. He went on to do a lot of production and, and toured with David Chappelle and uh, he's in Oakland with a residency now. Wow. So yeah, I actually I went to go uh, support him a couple, of, uh, a couple of weeks back. He popped his head out to do a little mixing. Oh, that's so, nice. Yeah, he's still in the system. <laughs> for that's sure. very nice. Well, as are you before the pandemic, you know, I follow you on social media and I felt like you were kind of bringing musical life back to Berkeley. Yeah, I, I started off on a, a mission about about 10 years back. I had a um, the loss of my mom really kind of sent me for a little spin there. And so from that, I needed to find some grounding. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to come back out and I'm going to terrorize. <laughs> you know? I'm going to have some fun, you know, and, and it, that that was like my concept. It's like, I'm going to come out here and just rock the world. And it really didn't happen like that. You know, <laughs> I, I, I jumped out and it was a bit of a struggle to kind of find my footing back into mm -hmm. the, uh, the industry because it had moved quite a bit. Right. And so out of respect, I kind of took on a different approach. You know, I figured I'd come back to the community, the one that I was born and raised in and just do some supportive work you know, to really grow myself back into it the right way. Because music is, you know, it, like I said before, it's an emotional tool. Mm. And, you know, I, I know how to use it, but, you know, it's a part of people that you have to be a part of as well and around. You know, you just can't be so alienated. And I didn't alienate myself. I was just kind of off the market, off the, the scene, I guess you can say for mm -hmm. a minute. But I, I really took a strong interest when I really looked at what was going on in Berkeley at that time. Um, there was like a big, a huge void, huge void. And so I went to just look at what events was going on at the time that I wanted to be a part of. So the Berkeley Juneteenth Festival, which I'd always went to um, would take my daughters as well. As much as I wanted to DJ, I've never really had the opportunity to because once they found out, you know, my skill sets of with the events, they were like, no, come on in and do this, come on and do that. You don't have time to DJ, get somebody else to do that. And so I earned my stripes, you know, I'm going on 12 years on that board. And um, that was, you know, just a, a little part of that back into the community. You've mentioned this earlier about your emotional connection with music. Is there an art to being a DJ? If you're with a particular crowd, what's going on with you? Hmm. Again, I've always had a love for music. So I'll spend probably at the minimum 20 hours a week downloading music, you know, and that takes me through world charts, just listening. And, you know, you got your suggested music or the ones that they push or the top 20, 50 or so, but you got to dig a little deeper. You know, you can have a few tricks up your sleeves and the stuff that you do to show, but musically, a lot of people aren't there to stare at the DJ. You really have to think about sometimes where you're at, definitely. You know, the crowd, the age bracket, you know, and if you're good, you can tap into that. You know, you, you really have to just tap into it. You know, one of those things would be, as I was doing the high school parties, you know, I, I still have all that, you know, all those number one hits in there and, and all the things that they love. And so now fast forward and they're 10 years older in their thirties. Right. If I want to take them back to that moment, I just go back to that file and I'd be like, oh my God, I've rocked the college crowd for seven years and I'm far from a college age. You know what I mean? It's because I've had that music and I've studied it. You know, I know it. I just don't play it. You know, there's an, an, an kind of an unwritten order in the playing music. And if you if you tap into that, then you'll have everybody in the room. What do you mean there's an unwritten order? What does that mean? Um, it's like I can explain it. Um, it's almost like playing them in chronological order. You know, if, if, if you're playing through a set and you start off in the 80s and you end up in the mid 90s, for example. 
you know, is somewhat of a journey for that person listening to that because they will, you know, kind of just, you know, they'll drift not even knowingly, you know, into that time with you. And then, and that's when you as a party girl, are like, Oh my God, you know, that, that, it, it, that it's, it's that next song that just takes you there. You know, it's already been building 10 songs and in, into that. But by the time that, that 10th song hits you, I got to go dance. You know, that, that, that's that moment for that, for that person. It's like uh, out of nowhere, it's like, Oh, let's go you know, um, because you tap them. Right. And when you're at an event, can you read the room? Or- oh, you better read the room. <laughs> That's what you bet. Oh, yeah. You know, when you catch people, you catch them singing the song, a verse of it, tapping their toes, um, you know, just body language should tell you a lot. I actually had an event called Body Language, and it was really geared on that on, on, on that concept of just observing the room and play to the room because some DJs will practice and have a 50 song set that they just have to kind of do, you know what I mean? They've been, you know, they've been in a garage for two months or whatever practicing and they get there and do it and they're not looking at the crowd. The crowd is not feeling it. It may be a great set, but that crowd is not getting it. I'm curious about this connection between your work in music, but also your work in the community. Do you, feel like there's one that's a stronger pull than the other? Or are they just completely so much meshed together? <laughs> I, I would say with me, they're married. Mm. They're married because with my music, I bring out the community and, and the community comes out for my music, you know, to, and to hear me play. And so, I mean, I'm working on a couple of events now with uh, the city of Berkeley mm. that um, I think should be carried on at least three to four times, you know, over the spring, summer, um, of every year, which I'm trying to do with them now. And that's, and it's definitely just like, you know, I like to see people come out, you know, um, and have a good time, you know, without all the hassle and stuff. And so I always look for not necessarily the simple route, you know, because throwing events in Berkeley, eh, there's a lot of loopholes you got to hit, <laughs> you know, and you got to hit them right, you know, I, 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 but um, from Juneteenth to Sunday streets, to the uh, Berkeley High School all-class picnic. The city of Berkeley, sad to say, at a time did not support hip hop. Hmm. They would not give you a permit to block off a street to have hip hop. Wow. Yeah, when I got on board the Juneteenth, it was funny because I'm still the youngest on the board. I say that (laughs) with some pride. Um, I was... I mean, stern warnings of no hip hop, you know, and, and, and they just thought I was coming in with hip hop. I was like, no, I don't, I, I never said what I was going to do. At that time, if we were going to have anything that resembled rap, we had to submit the lyrics to the police department. We're talking 2007, eight, wasn't that long ago? Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, we had managed the event outstanding. You know I mean? Like you, there was no faults in how we were doing it. And I wanted to add a little bit more too, because people were saying it's, it seemed to be getting old, mm. you know, and I wanted to bring more youth into it. Mm-hmm. And so I, I started that with an artist, Aisha Fukushima. Oh yeah. She's a talented poet, um, singer. And so she also does a little rap, right? And I figure, you know, and this was, uh, I met her actually at Hip Hop in the Park. And I was like, you know, I'm going to have you come down in a couple of months if you want and do Juneteenth, right? Because I figured it'd be a perfect way to kind of bridge it back in like spoken word over beats instead of rap. And so, I, you know, she had a positive message. She had a great show. And I just went for it. I was like, you know what? If I catch flack for her, I'll catch flack for her. But it's not really rap. I mean, she's great. Like, how can they say she had a full band, you know? And so... The show went on with, without a hitch, you know, and the police were not purposely parked by the stage because they always were down on that end. I'm just thinking, okay, I'm going to hear anything. I didn't hear anything. I was like, you know what? It worked. And so the next year I had a gospel rapper come in, right? And I started to kind of ease it back into Juneteenth just a little bit. And so at the same time, I'm doing hip hop in the park. And I had an idea of growing hip hop in the park. Which park are we talking the, about? The infamous park, People's Park. <gasps> Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. Okay. The park in Berkeley, like the most notorious park probably on the West Coast. Right. Um, um, and so, you know, Hip Hop in the Park had started in 96. And I came on board well, probably about 2011 or so. And after about four years into it, I was like, you know, we can do, we can grow this event. You know what I mean? I had gained the trust of the students. I had bridged the relationship with them in the city. 
uh, to be a stronger. And then I wanted to block off Haste Street because I wanted to put vendors. It's like, look, we put vendors here, block off the street. The event can get more money. We can get more artists. You know, we can just kind of grow the event. And they were like, oh my God, that sounds great. Now the park is owned by UC Berkeley. Right. Street belongs to the city. Right. So I went to go block off the street. The city was like, oh, no. Um, that's when I found out that they didn't support hip hop. <gasps> I see. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, are you kidding me? Like, since when? Like, at that time, this was, uh, should I say, the official response was it's a little too close to the event. Try next year. Mm. I'm like, okay, I'm going to try next year. Next year, we got it approved. We blocked off the street, expanded the event. We had skaters up and down the street, vendor booths. And the growth of the event went from, um, I was just looking at this the other day on the Facebook page. Um, first year I got there, we had 900 people saying that we we're going. Within two years, we had over 10,000 people. Wow. Saying that they were going. Wow. Because we, you know, the event grew. And that was, you know, I won't take the, that credit for it. I'll take some because it was the vision of growing the event and the event grew. Right. You know, um, uh, all due um, to the students as well, accepting me into the group, you know, right. and, and an older black man here in Berkeley, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, it was, it was a great relationship that I still have, um, a lot of friends through that network. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I attacked the community, the high school, the college, because, um, it needed it. You know, I, you know, I, it's, I guess it's a bold statement, but it just wasn't nothing going on in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Even talking to, you know, my friends is like, man, what's it doing in Berkeley? Everybody's going to Oakland and San Francisco. So right. I wanted to fill the void. When my daughter turned 13, your daughter DJed her birthday party. <laughs> she sure did. Yeah. And she was amazing. Have you taught all of your mm -hmm. kids how to DJ or? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Um, I, I've, I've given them all the opportunity. You know, I was one of those parents. I didn't want to be like, push it on them. You know, I, I, looking back on, I probably could have pushed it a little bit more. Um, but they have went on to throw some of their own parties. Um, so, you know, I'll give them the equipment. Uh, Natalie, uh, she's attending Wesley and she just returned from her first year. And she's now the chair of her entertainment branch of her sorority. Wow! And so she's going to go back with a better skill set, um, a little training over the summer because she's, you know, they already plan on giving all these parties coming back because their whole first year was wiped from them. So. Right. So yeah, it's definitely in the blood. <laughs> You've created this legacy. Yeah. My kids will always say, um, they call it a curse, but it's a good curse because they know all the old school music, you know, because growing up, you know, when they were growing up, I wasn't going to play certain songs while, you know, so I just kept it all old school. Let's play all old school. <laughs> so they're in a car singing everything that I grew up with, right? right. <laughs> yeah, that's a lesson, parents, you know, play, play what you grow up to so your kids, are, you know, do the same. Right, right. I tried and many, many <laughs> of my stuff was rejected. It happens. You know, I mean, I've, I've always had this thing of just about bringing people together. You know, most of my events are free. I don't really, you know, get into charging people an astronomical amount of money. The event I have coming up with the city, I'll leak it here. It's going to be kind of like a big roller skate party. We're going to block off a street in Berkeley and we're just going to invite everybody down with roller skates. We're going to have a park as our backdrop, some music and as the event grows, we'll probably add vendors and stuff like that. Maybe a kid's zone and stuff like that, just to kind of have, you know, something within town because there's just not enough going on in Berkeley, I think, to support what we have there in a great community. Oh, that sounds so fun. Is it slated for this summer? Oh, yeah. The goal is to do at least three and a fourth one, maybe in October, would be some type of Halloween costume, oh. skate, something of another. You know, Berkeley can get kind of crazy with... Yeah you know, creativity. Yeah. Right? So yeah, I guess stand by for that Halloween. One. Okay. Yeah. Oh, those sounds so fun. You said that it was the death of your mother that brought you back to want to get out there. Mm -hmm. Why did you turn to this idea of music, playing music for others mm. during that time? Mm -hmm. It seems like you were grieving and how? Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that was a uh, big time grieving. I really said that time how I could maybe time travel is a bit heavy to use, but I, I really found myself transported by music, I should say, away from what I was feeling and experiencing at the time. 
you know, at, at times when I was, you know, in my moments, I would play music, mm. you know what I mean? And then it would be something that would draw me back to um, some of the better times. And, I, you know, it, I guess it just struck a chord with me because, you know, I just got up one day and I was like, you know, I need to go play somewhere. You know, I, I, I need to find me a location, like wherever, I don't care, just where. And at the time, um, there was a location, the Shattuck Down Low, and there was a bar above it called Passans. And the Down Low had their thing going on strong. Passans had nothing upstairs, but I would pass by and see a nice little crowd in there. And I went there and had a drink one day, started a conversation with the bartender. It's like, hey, you know, I'm thinking, let me come in and plug in one day. And he was like, well, school's about to let out. And, um, you know, the town's going to get kind of slow. So I don't know what you think you can do. I was like, I'll take your slowest day of the week. Just let me have it. And it's like a Sunday. And I was like, I can do a Sunday. Sure. <laughs> I had no problem. And, and it took only two weeks. And um, I, I, it was like one of the funnest and, and best things I've could have done for myself at that moment. Because I, you know, I, I, I took my emotions and feelings and put that into those four hour sets, you know what I mean? And I just kind of really just, you know, the, the, the crowd was there, but it didn't matter for the most part. And then, you know, when I looked up around that third week, I was like, holy moly, I got something here, right? And then, yeah, it was, I, I just had to really ground myself at that time. You know what I mean? Because, it, you know, things are just going crazy with family and, you know, the, the, the material things, you know, all the, 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 the bad things that could happen when you lose your, your leader, your, 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 your family matriarch, you know what I mean? So, and I couldn't let that take me down, you know, tear me down, you know what I mean? And so having music was just like, like, like my key. So I was just like, you know what, let me just kind of, you know, take that concept because music can be healing. You know, we all know that it can be soothing. I see more from just a DJ's perspective, but it is that perspective that's giving me kind of insight on how I want to be able to work with people and bring people together and in, in the events I want to be involved with. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's not really about the party. It's about the community that you bring together. And so this event that I'm working with um, the downtown Berkeley Association with is, is going to be everything I just said in one event. Um, we're finalizing some of the details now, but I'm hoping the first one um, should be in July. This is the roller skating. Yeah. You know, as as, as, as we're planning it, it's, it's going to be that and a lot more. I mean, there's even talks of, um, because looking at Center Street, if, if, if we ran it all the way up to the BART station, we could go ahead and attempt to bring the uh, Guinness World Record back, the longest soul train line. It's like when I took the picture the other day, I was like, wait a minute. I think that's the footprint. Like, you know, just kind of snuck up on me. I was like, you know, you know, to be continued. But that's the title I think I, 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 I'm, I'm willing to, you know, take on to bring back because, you know, it, we're the first in Berkeley. Right. Um, to achieve that. To hold this record, mm -hmm. uh, and it's the it's the longest Soul Train. The way they were it is the largest Soul Train line, and when we did it, we had two hundred and ten, and I think now the record is three hundred and something, or maybe close to four hundred. Oh, you can beat that. Totally beat that, but it's it's a very long event. You know, I mean, you have to stand in line uh, the whole time, and you have to wait until that pair who be you know at the top comes all the way down before the next one goes. Wow. And so we're talking a six hour event, you know, almost like a marathon dance in a sense. Oh so, gosh. you know, it's, it's not for, you know, like you really have to be in shape. You got to have water, probably some medics on the side. People might be cramping, you know, some massage tables along the route. But, you know, it's something that, you know, has been talked about um, strongly. I think we can do it. We have to do it. We have to attempt, you know, yes. even if we don't make it, it'll be a great party. Yes. <laughs> I think I'll be the person volunteering to hand out water in that one, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, Orlando, I have a question for you. It seems like in many ways it would be a lot easier for you to go into other cities in the Bay Area, such as Oakland, such as San Francisco, and do a lot of the events that you're talking about starting in Berkeley. So why... 
Why do you stick with Berkeley? What does that mean to you to bring music and events to Berkeley? Oh, that's a pretty deep question. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I guess working backwards in that, uh, you know, being from Berkeley, born and raised, um, has given me that unfound love that you would find for, I guess, someone in the city. I mean, and it's not perfect by far. <laughs> Berkeley is not the perfect city, but it did provide the perfect opportunity, I think, growing up in a lot of ways for me to understand myself, um, get to know people um, from different backgrounds, you know, um, being in different households that um, were from different parts of the world. Um, so it was, you know, just that part alone was a great experience. Having kids go through the Berkeley school system was I moved to Oakland for a little bit and moved back to Berkeley. And so that just kind of made me dig in a little deeper. You know, I was volunteering at the high school before my daughter, my, my oldest even got there. I was there like two years before. Um, hence, that's when we did the Soul Train line, uh, the Guinness Book of World Records, right? And just kind of then realized, you know, well, there's a void here. And then, you know, I, I found myself in this position kind of today of, you know, as I say, respectfully, having the pulse of Berkeley and music and understanding the different pockets of people. And, you know, it's, it's kind of come with a natural progression over the past mm -hmm. 10 years, but also time before that growing up in Berkeley. You know, I, I think Berkeley has always been this rich environment and we get a lot out of it. And sometimes it kind of seeps away to other cities, you know, um, you get people like, um, and I'll just use some recent history of people, um, Paul Mooney, who just passed, um, great comedian, went to Berkeley High. But, you know, he was from Oakland. And so Oakland kind of claimed him real quick and now they're having a Paul Mooney day. And it's like, oh, okay. Kamala Harris went to school in Berkeley, but she got the Oakland ties and Oakland's like, oh, Kamala Harris is ours. It's like, oh. Um, we have people in the music industry, um, g Easy and um, Kehlani mm -hmm. went through the Berkeley school system and then they kind of ended up in Oakland and now they claim Oakland, it's like, uh, I was like, you know, if I ever make it, Berkeley, we're on the map. So, you know, I, I always felt like I had to kind of keep, you know, you know, repping my city. You know, I, I'll just put it like that. You know, like nobody else is doing it. We've had so many people come through here. I don't know if they're afraid of Berkeley or saying Berkeley. Now, Berkeley doesn't sound as, I don't know, as maybe strong as Oakland does in some ways. And I get that. You know what I mean? You know, saying you're from Berkeley, it's like, ah, oh, you square. <laughs> like, yeah, well, a little bit. You know what I mean? But I'm sharp on all corners, as they say. Oakland is, you know, in, in other areas of the Bay, as we all know, can be very different, you know, with different communities and in, in how they kind of go about their way of life. And, and I say that with all due respect, because you find different parties in different climates mm -hmm. in each city. You know what I mean? And so you know, a lot of the music that I play in Berkeley wouldn't be so well accepted in Oakland. You know what I mean? And it may be viewed differently. And so as a DJ, you got to know your you know, where you set your, 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 yourself up to play because <laughs> you might get played, you know what I mean, by that crowd, like, ah, oh, you know, we're not, you know what I mean? So you you, you, you really have to know. So um, I have a lot of respect for um, all the DJs in the Bay Area. Um, and Oakland is, is not that far off mm -hmm. my calendar. Um, I could very well be in Oakland in two weeks from now. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah, so, um, it, it, which I'm really looking forward to because it's a great city mm -hmm. to play for. You know, it's a great community. Um, and you know, I, I am a part of that community, even though being from Berkeley, I have a lot of friends, family. Um, when my family first moved to the Bay Area, it was in uh, West okay. Oakland. Yeah. 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 So, okay. yeah. I love my city. <laughs> As you should. As you should. Yeah. Orlando, thank you so much for being on the show today. If people want to learn more about either what you're up to, where you're playing, or an event that you're connected with in Berkeley, where can they look? Social media wise, Instagram is DJ Oasis. That's DJ O-A-C-E-S. 
Facebook. You can find me there. Um, currently, I'm holding a residency at SPATS. And as far as reopening, hopefully under wraps here the next month or so, you know, one of those things coming out of the pandemic, we don't want to rush it. You know, I, as much as I miss it and coming back is one of those things is, you know, let's just take our time with it. You know, it shouldn't be that much of a hurry. Everybody should be out seeing family first anyway, and then we'll party after that. So uh, I'm looking maybe July. Thank you so much, Orlando. And I can't wait to come out and dance again. Well, when I fire up that dance floor, I'm going to give you a call. (laughs) You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Remember to be in touch on my Facebook page, Art Heals All Wounds, and also on Twitter and Instagram at Art Heals Podcast. I'm so grateful to Orlando Williams for joining me on this episode of Art Heals All Wounds. If you want to follow Orlando on social media, he's at DJ Oasis. That's DJ O A C E S on Instagram and Orlando Williams on Facebook. If you like this episode of Art Heals All Wounds, be sure to subscribe to the podcast so that you catch all future episodes. Thanks for listening. The music you've heard in this podcast is Yellow Light District and Otto Waschenlage Instrumental by Lobo Loco. Beethoven's Piano Sonata No. 15 in D Major was performed by Karina Galanian. (laughs) 